growing up in rural Kenya, Musembe, did you think of yourself as poor? No, I never for a day thought that I was poor. I didn't have a lot of stuff. I can tell you that I had a school uniform. I, we had one pair of shoes that we wore to weddings and the church, and then a couple of clothes. And, but I had a lot of family around me and a lot of friends of my age and older. So when did the concept of poor or feeling that what you had wasn't enough or that it was less than others had, when did that realization come to you? Actually, I've never felt like I had less. In fact, the problem that I have now is that I have too much because now I live in plenty. And so I happen to have just adjusted like everybody else. But when we were growing up, I grew up at a good time in the uh, 70s when people in the West who had, who had plenty didn't want to have it anymore. And they were going up as peace corps and they were going in other places as, uh, uh, as, uh, as uh, um, weapons. And uh, so they were just casting away what they had. But our concern was not on poverty. Our concern was for the liberation of Africa. And so what we read at that particular time was civil rights writings. And we read what people were saying about personal freedoms and personal empowerments. And so I was lucky to have been taught by the first generation of Africans that were telling us that we are someone and we should believe in ourselves. And so nobody would have told me that I was poor because we had enough to eat in the rural areas. At school, when I went into high school, I could see that there were girls who would be dropped by cars at school. But that didn't bother me because we all wore the same uniform. And what really mattered is how well you did in your schoolwork and how much you could volunteer to assist communities around us. So actually, the question of poverty didn't bother me growing up at all. Somewhere along the way, though, you saw a life for yourself outside of Africa, a life of schooling and education. What were those moments of realization? How, how much of it came from that particular time in Africa, your own family? Where, where did your motivations come from? Exactly, thank you. Um, actually, I started to know sufficiently about the differences between worlds in which people live when I moved into the city to do my university education. Then I could see what slum life looked like. Because there, you would find people that are crowded together, but they are not able to make community because they are very busy really just surviving. And in that place, you really see who is poor and who is not poor. I was privileged to travel to India when I was really young and see similar distinctions in city life. And thereafter, the world was open to me. I was able to see other parts of the world, traveled in Europe, came here in the US to study, and see a lot of people who looked like me had more needs than people who didn't look like me. So I began to define that poverty doesn't just come like that. You are likely to be poor if you have certain underprivileges when you don't have power. You are more likely to be poor if you're black, because I did realize by my expansion of the world knowledge that most places and most people who were under who had less, really looked like me. And I began to do a different kind of analysis. I began to see that poverty is not always a lack of things, but it's very contextual. And really, the space, what lies between poverty and plenty is power. And when you do not have the power to decide on your life, when you do not have the power 
to be at the table of the decision making, when you do not have the power to be recognized that you have ideas, then you really become poor, first because you, don't not, you do not contribute ideas that could help the situation, neither are you valued. And I realized that there's something that comes with being a woman and not having power. Because many of the people that I saw in many parts of the world that were considered poor or were poor were women. And so my passion in this, my give back, is a devotion to really work together with women to find solutions that address poverty, but poverty is not material. Poverty is connected with security. You are not secure if you are violated. You are not secure if you are not respected for what you bring to the table. You are not secure if you don't have a job. You are not secure if you become pregnant when you're not ready. You're not secure if you can't make choices of where to work, how to work, etc. So these issues of security are really important in terms of dealing with the space between poverty and plenty. And that's what I do daily in my life today, to try and address a holistic, structural, systemic way of approaching poverty and also reducing plenty. Remember I said reducing pl uh, plenty, not poverty. That's not a mistake. Because I think that what, where we've reached today is consumption that is beyond what we really need. Dr. Kanyora, in your work and in, in these observations, where do you see the, the biggest gaps that's still keeping us from a greater balance between those who don't have enough and those who have too much? I see the biggest gap, of course, if we go by um, uh, continents, you would say that Africa still is the poorest in those things. But again, we have to define, um, when we define our nations according to the uh, GDP of the nations, whether that is really what should be uh, uh, the process of defining. There are new economies who are arguing that that is not the way to define economies of the world, uh, economies of the world. We define and say and give the story of people who have to live on less than a dollar a day, but we don't tell the story of the other people. So I think that part of where I see the greatest gap for me is one, how media uh, tells the story of people. I really see a great gap there because media continues not to lift up things that work in other places. And if you hear all of the time a negative story, then that's what you know. But I believe that there's more even in poor countries. The second area where I see the gap is that currently there is a lot of uh, uh, improvements and sharing between countries of the South. If you very, very progressive countries, if you look at the say the BRICS group of countries and others. There is a participation of women in certain parts of our world that is much greater, and it's bringing in new changes. We all celebrate Rwanda, for example, but it's not just the 55% of women are in parliament. You have to go a little deep and say, so what is the impact on that on the societies in Rwanda? And you will go to, to the rural area, and you will see that it's actually going beyond. Or when a woman such as Cecilia Brew in Nigeria finds the fifth largest bank and then gives a billion of her own dollars towards education, that is really progress. Those kind of stories don't get told. New writers. So for me, I see the biggest gap in is one is in how we tell the story and how we do not value the in local institutions and local people with the ideas that they have. At the Global Fund for Women where I work, it's really important for us to invest in the local capacity, in the local people, in, in local institutions, in women-led organizations, and raising up the status 
and the story of women. I see a gap. I believe women are part of the larger answer, not only to poverty, but to the progress of nations. And I'm really delighted to say that this is where I see my passion, because I see solutions coming out of women's uh, uh, possibilities and opportunities. And you yourself are such a great role model for exactly how that is evolving. And now, as you say, it's your passion to give it to other women. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on this, Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you.